Welcome to In the Dark, everybody. Hope everybody is having a wonderful day or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. I have a special guest on tonight. Uh, his name is Ash Hamilton, and he is an award-winning filmmaker. He has made a movie called Holes in the Sky, The Sean Miller Story, and it's been nominated for uh, several awards and won some awards. It's, it's, it looks really good. I haven't actually had a chance to watch the entire movie yet. I started to tonight just to kind of see what it was about. And it is, it looks really fascinating. I can, I can actually understand why, um, it's captivated people. So I have him on. Um, I do plan on having him on another time. We ended up in a very lengthy, conversation, which was just a blast. I had so much fun talking to Ash. He's such a neat guy. And I do want to have him back on for another interview because he, we, we just never got around to talking about, um, the paranormal experiences he's had throughout his life. And I'd really like to have him on to, you know, tell you about that as well. But this was just a, a great interview. I really enjoyed it and I hope you enjoy it as well. So, on with the show. Hello, Ash. Hey, Tracy. How you doing? I'm doing really good. How are you? I'm doing great. Now that I that, know when my birthday is. Yeah, I just I I was gonna say I have to say this to everybody that you had actually forgotten your own birthday party. That is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. It's weird because we we sort of like sort of hung out. My wife and I hung out yesterday for my birthday, right? Mm-hmm. So. I just entirely forgot that we had something planned. So like the day we had to go take my son for the, the annual see Santa. Mm -hmm. right? So, and she's like, we got to get back. Like, we, yeah. Like, Why? Yeah. And then all of a sudden I was like, Oh, that. Yeah. Just your birthday. Can I just ask how old day. you are? Uh, I, a very sprightly 46 today. <laughs> I will not reveal my age if it kills me. Somebody can ask me to blue, <laughs> blue, green, and purple in the face, and I will lie every time. So I'm just like, I'm not telling anybody. I don't even I don't even acknowledge my birthdays anymore. I'm no, like, I think there's a physical age, mm -hmm. and then there's like the real age. Mm -hmm. So as long as we can just portray a physical age. Yeah, I think we're yeah. fine, and and mine is probably far more immature than oh, my God. real age. Anyway, yeah, everybody that meets me thinks I'm really young. Like they think that, you know, my I had two sisters, and they always thought I was the youngest. And I just I have a way about the way I talk and everything. And then and then every time I talk about my grandchildren, I think, why am I doing this? Why am I telling anybody I have grandchildren? So it's terrible, but I always feel like, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, Terms of Endearment with Shirley yes. MacLaine, mm -hmm. one of my favorites. It just kill. It's just a tearjerker from hell. I mean, but it's, it's, um, it just, I always loved the movie, how she wouldn't let the kids call her grandma and, you know, she just, it was such a great movie. I just love that movie, but like how, how we've successfully avoided being grandparents at this point yeah. is literally a miracle. Yeah, yeah. How old's your oldest kid? Well, she just turned twenty. Okay, that's that is a miracle. Yeah, and and we've got a a seventeen year old that's going to be eighteen. Oh, that was always sort of pushing the envelope. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that's the one that surprises. Yeah, yeah. More than anything. <laughs> My it's daughter like, had. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Day we made it through another day. We made it through another yeah. day every day. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's what life's all about. One step at a time, I guess, you know. Yeah, we, we've got the chalk marks on the wall to prove it. Like, okay, <laughs> 78 days. Yeah. Teenage pregnancy. Okay, we're good. <laughs> the only thing we have on the wall are their heights. We always measure their heights. The one day my one son came over, he's my second, my second child. And he's, um, my kids are all, they're all really tall, except for my middle daughter, who's very little. She's, she got her height from my grandmother. 
And so she's like in the center. Then there's just these like pillars. There's two on one side and two on the other that are all real tall. But um, my one son came over and he put on the wall like six foot eight or something. And I was dying. <laughs> I was like, our family's so nuts. Like they're all crazy. You should we just were... keep pushing it and see like when guests come over. Like, do you really have a kid that's <laughs> seven two? I know. I know. Our family's so nuts. They were gonna. We were gonna do. Um, TLC had us up for a reality show. We were gonna do. We were all ready to do it, and something fell through, and we just we just never ended up doing it. But you know, we it was really funny because our family's so large and it's crazy, and we have an ice cream truck company, and you know, it was kind of gonna be based on <laughs> that. Blows my mind. That blows my mind. That you have an ice cream truck. Like like not that it should be mind blowing, <laughs> but I'm just like that's like. An ice cream, ice cream truck, like company, just blows mm -hmm. my mind. Yeah, yeah. I've had seven trucks in total, and I've done it for this will be my thirteenth season. So it's you know thirteen years almost of of you know doing this. And what happened was I was so disheartened by the ice cream trucks the way they looked, and I couldn't stand. There's so many ice cream trucks that people literally just throw together these like stalker looking vans. <laughs> Right. You know, and they drive around and they just, you know, it's like you wouldn't even you wouldn't even buy something for your dog off these trucks. Like, and they're scary, you right. know, and, and they, they've used house paint and brushes yeah. to <laughs> make like a horrible, like John Wayne Gacy pogo s clown face on the side of it. It's like, awful. Sorry, kid. But yeah, so I, I just I, I put together the one year for whatever reason, I just put together this really cute bus and I only really ever use buses. I've had vans, but I don't like them. Mm -hmm. I got rid of vans because I was like ice cream trucks should always be a bus, in my opinion, because buses are so psychologically they're so approachable. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I love the way the aesthetics and stuff of the buses. So I have the I have one left and I was going to get out of the business and I sold my blue bus, which was my first one. This thing was so cute and I sold it and then I saw this yellow and I don't know what has happened to me, but over the years I've grown to just adore the color yellow. Okay. And my favorite color is green, but I love blue too. You know, I love colors in general. I love all like just colors. I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store with colors, you know? And mm -hmm. I saw this really bright yellow bus. It was, it was actually a party bus and this thing has strobe lights, like colorful strobe lights and everything inside. And I had to have it. So I bought this one and, you know, put a serving window in and just put the, I should build ice cream trucks for people is what I should do. Um, but I, I've got, I mean, I deck them out with pinatas and magnets and stickers and posters and, you know, lights. And I mean, these things are so cool. They're just beautiful. And, um, and so that's what I did. And I usually chase all the competition out wherever I go. Like everybody just is well, like, because no. they've all got those hand painted rape mm -hmm. bands. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's like custom. Like it's, it's beautiful. In fact, I'm going to put up a, a board, um, a digital screen. Uh, this coming year instead of the, you know, the, cause I use magnets for the decals. I magnetize them. And then when I run out of something, I take the decal off the bus altogether. So I don't have to put signs up on it or anything like that. But, um, and then I'm thinking about using the other side of the bus as an advertising billboard, like a, putting a digital sign on the one side and using it for advertising for companies. But and do you it, have the music that's like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I, this yeah. has been like not like a burning question. Like not if you'd look at my dream diaries, you'd see this like every night. Like <laughs> still no sleep until I find the answer. Dot dot yeah. dot. But I've always wondered like where where do you get the music? Where does Ice Cream Trucks get the music? Well, like, you, do you you program buy, it? No, you. Well, what well, what I did was I actually still have my first music box that went to my bus. My blue bus was sold to an Asian family that took it to uh, Maryland. It got to the point it got so, so old that it was, it was beautiful, but it still got older and it needed a lot of stuff done to it mechanically in order for inspection. And I thought, well, you know, time to upgrade with this one anyway. And I, I let it go because I thought I was getting out of the business. And so this Asian family bought it to use it as a stand. So they have it as an ice cream stand down in Maryland which would be adorable, like Fredericksburg or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I got this, you know, beautiful yellow bus and I'll just send you pictures of it. And, um, uh, I, it comes with a box that's already programmed. You buy the boxes, they're Omni boxes and they have all the music in them. So, that, okay. 
Yeah. And because that's just been like, that's one of those unanswered questions. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, already where there. Where do ice cream trucks get their music? Yeah. They're, they're already there. Now, I'd love to do music. I would love to actually put songs on it. And I was thinking about like Christmas music would be really neat because I'm out till December. I run from March till December because my customers are still out. So I, I literally only have off uh, January and February now. And, and and where are you located? Like, I'm are in, you in a somewhat or, warm place? No, it's, it's cold. It's cold now. But I mean, we, we're having like, right now we're having like 50 degree days, you know, 45. Right, yeah. So it's still warm enough that people are out and, you know, people are now it gets slower. It gets a lot uh, slower in December, but I have such a customer base. Like it's, it's so crazy how many customers I do have and how much, how busy I am that, you know, my slow days is what another ice cream trucks, you know, normal day would be. So it's, you know, there's no reason not to do it, but you know, I do, I, I have to, give up January and February because I live kind of up, up on a hill that is a little bit towards, it's kind of country and kind of city. Like the front of the house is kind of town. And then mm-hmm. you go far back and it's all like wooded and it's more feel like it feels like a country area. So this, this road, we have like a back dirt road that turns into like a ski slope <laughs> in the winter. And so there's no way <laughs> I'm getting this bus up and down this road, you know? <laughs> so, and I wouldn't want to anyway. I need that time off because that's when I do all my creative stuff. Like I write kids books. Like I told you, mm-hmm. fact, I was gonna, I was gonna send you the <clears throat> the Christmas story and say, you know, kind of nudge and say, hey Ash, why don't you send me a picture of what you think this one page would be? You know, a drawing, <laughs> and then you can. But you know, I don't know if you want to get involved with that. But I need illustrations for it, and I'm dreading doing them again. I'm like, oh no. You know, I don't know if I can do these illustrations again because it takes so much time. Well, I'm always happy to help. Always. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you because I'm going to read it on the podcast here soon. And um, I like to read them. It's just fun. You know, I like to share creativity and stuff. And, you know, but, um, you know, just it's just it's just a fun thing. But I do that in the winter and I, I homeschool my one son and I'm learning. I'm always learning languages. I speak like five languages now, but I'm, I'm always learning new languages and I play the piano and this, this winter I made a deal that I was going to teach myself, start to teach myself violin. And, um, there's just always stuff I'm doing, you know, it's like you, you're the same way, you know, I I, I definitely try. Um, I I gotta admit, I'm a little jealous of the languages. That's something that I've always been wanting to do. And and just, that was something that I've never been able to to shoehorn in, never been able to find the time for. It would just do it. Like when you're in the car, if you're traveling, I don't know if you do any traveling or if you mm-hmm. do any driving, any extra time you have, if you're doing dishes in the kitchen or fixing something in the garage, put something on your phone that's, you know, teaching you languages and just start doing it. And just, you know, any extra time, just like put something on your phone where you're learning, you know, just make like an hour a day, take an hour a day or half an hour a day, even to learn a, a new word or a new sentence. And I'm telling you, it accumulates. You know, that's what I do. Well, I do like to drive. I'm I'm one of those rare people that mm, I do, I do too. almost always take driving over flying, even though I don't have a fear of flying. Like I've flown a lot in my life, but mm-hmm. even if it's like an 18, 20 hour drive, I almost always will take the drive over flying. Yeah, I love it. Doesn't mean drive. I don't regret it. Like there have been times <laughs> where at the end of the trip, I'm like, never again. <laughs> like I'll just have them freeze my body and then we'll thaw it out whenever we get there. So that I don't have like to Mr. The wheel. <laughs> well, Mr. T you in order to put you on an airplane. <laughs> yeah. As long as like a fly doesn't get in the brundle pod, they can just teleport me to yeah. Disney because I don't oh, want to be there driving it. I wish we had teleportation. I know it's out there somewhere. We just haven't tapped into it yet. Oh, I'm positive of it. Absolutely oh, positive. Too. Me too. It's, I would it's love in that to. warehouse right beside the uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's <so> <laughs> My God, it's got to be that time travel, and I mean, it's all there. I just, God, I wish we could access that stuff. You know, I just, I, I think that would be truly like the invention that changed the world. Like oh I, God. Almost more so than like anything else. I know that everyone talks about like advancements in geriatrics and stuff, you know, and lengthening the longevity of human life. But no, give us a teleporter. Yeah. And I think it would totally change everything. Just be amazing. You know, I I just, 
I mean, it's just so sad. Some of the stuff that, you know, there's abilities there that we just, we don't even know they're at our fingertips and we, we have no idea, you know, and it's like, we get glimpses of it through telepathy and through, you know, having, you know, like psychic stuff that we deal with and all that stuff. But it's, it's like, you know, it's there. You just, you just, you know, it's like, if we just had somebody to teach us how to tap into it, that's what you we know, need to do. We and I think that we've went <coughs> definitely down some wrong paths over the last like 400 years or so, like yeah. when it comes to education. Um, and then I'm like, I'm, I'm an educator. I, I taught high school for years and I taught college uh, for years too. And I actually still teach college as an adjunct now, in addition to everything else that I do. Yeah. And I, if, if I could, you know, give anyone any advice, you know, it's like, we, we need more how to live your life, how to live by philosophy and how to live spiritually classes. Yeah. Like, like we just, you know, we're so focused on like <laughs> rudimentary math. It's like, no, I, I think there's a path that has a lot of math for some people. And we right. need those mathematicians for that hard science. But like yeah. at the same time, like, would it be great if we had a high school class that was like, like not losing your shit 101? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was the class. Well, like, you know, that's... here's how we could just live life. I, I've thought about that with schooling and I've, I've often wondered why they really don't focus on like the arts more and that like learning, like kids should learn, truly learn, you know, like they, they give music classes, but they don't like say, Hey, you know, pick an instrument and let's teach each of you an instrument or, and how about karate? So you guys can defend yourself. Right. Yeah. You know, how about, you know, how about learning how to balance a checkbook, you know, like stuff like that. Like, it, right. and you know, they label these classes like music class, home economics. I don't even know if they do that anymore. I don't even, I've never even heard of, I haven't heard of home ex for, for, for home ec for a long time, but they they don't really focus in on what children really need in order to get through life completely. Now the math of obviously, you know, there's stuff like history. History is great. Although I've never been really into history. I know that seems to be more of a male thing. Men seem to really like, I've noticed a lot of men I talk to really love history and I'm always like, eh, I know you need to know it, but I, I'm, I'm more like, give me languages, you know, the right. math and algebra and stuff like that. Like I love that sciences. Like I'm, I'm kind of into that kind of stuff, you know, but um, but they just, there are some things there that the schools are lacking and that the kids should really need to know. And like I said, one of them is self-defense and the other one is like, you know, basic, just life skills that they need. And unfortunately they don't get it till they're out on their own and then they got to figure it all out. And then they make so many mistakes trying to figure it out, <clears throat> you know? So I think it, it's, it's strange that we don't have a system to focus on quality of life like that's something yeah. that <clears throat> just seems to be just not on the board you know it's mm -hmm. not really ever really been available for us not just as as americans but i think globally like we've never focused on this idea of how do we approach the topic of quality of life how yeah. do we improve it how right. do we get people happy like these are concepts that shouldn't be as abstract as they are, you know, like happiness should be something that people realize that they can work on. But mm -hmm. I think if you talk to the average person and you talk to them about happiness or fulfillment, or even this idea of like personal enrichment or, or wealth, but not even wealth in the monetary sense, like a personal wealth, mm -hmm. like people have a lot of difficulty entering that conversation. They have a lot of difficulty talking about it. They have a lot of difficulty sort of pinning down what it means to them. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that unfortunately is very concerning to me Yeah, that those are the conversations that we have great difficulty with when we shouldn't like, those should be conversations that we're having daily with right. not only like our level, but with strangers, we should be able to enter a conversation that's, not dependent on, you know, divisive politics, but that's more dependent on how are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that I can do to make this better? I think if we started asking those questions, we might be in a much different and, and better place than we are now. I know. I know. I know. I, I just, I don't know. We're... <sighs> I'm just, I wake up so many days. I'm just confused. You know, I just, I don't, oh yeah, it's just so many questions. I, and you know, unanswered things I have. And 
I just, I just need a really good session with God, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And I, and I think that that's something also that we sort of need to, to teach. And I think we can teach in a way that it's sort of like, you know, non-nominational, you know, that it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's oh, definitely. That, yeah. that we can just bring people in and say, Hey, it's, it's okay to ask the universe questions. Right. Like it's okay to have a conversation with the universe like it's okay to sit down and ask questions that you don't have the answers for because mm -hmm. sometimes the, even you know non-dependent on what you believe in sometimes you get those answers but i think again we're 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 in a very weird place where and, and maybe it hasn't even happened since like the age of enlightenment you know maybe it hasn't even really happened since like the greeks but we're in that place where um, we find stuff like that goofy, you know, like mm. as a mainstream, like populace. Yeah. We find yeah. sort of like talking to an empty room sort of goofy, even though we do it as humans, yeah. like we do it a lot more than we think we do. And it's too bad that we've got to that point where we sort of think that's silly or that's goofy because I, I sort of think that that stuff is, is necessary. Like I do sort too. Of have to. Yeah, but the problem I run into, I don't know if you've run into this, is the people, the depth that people possess when you talk to, and not, not everybody, you know, you do run into some people that you can really connect with on a, you know, a mental, you know, level, but it's, there's just a lot that you run into and they just look at you like you're just like, they're just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and, and I run into that a lot. You just, you can't really get into any in fact, I, most of the people I'm around physically are that way. And then when I get online and I connect to people through the podcasting or, you know, I, I kind of reach out into the, you know, wherever that's mm -hmm. where I find the people that have more deeper thinking, you know, but the people that I access every day, it's like, my God, it's, it's just such average thought processes, not to knock them because they're probably happier, you know, they're probably <laughs> much happier the people than you know the people that are deeper thinkers are like I don't looking know, past just, those surface level details. right yeah everything's real easy for them like it's just kind of get up you know do the housework you know go to work come home take care of the family everything's great i'm just like man my mind is like so out there and, and just trying to process things and figure things out and i have so many questions and i want to learn so much i have such a hunger for learning you know and it, it's just really hard for me it's really difficult. I, I agree. I mean, I would much rather wake up and have like my biggest existential crisis be that I'm out of cereal. <laughs> I, <laughs> I really envy people like this. Like, 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 you know, I'm even my two neighbors, I'm surrounded by them and they're just such, you know, they're just so happy in their lives and going along and you even try to get into any kind of cover and they just look at you like, what are you talking about? Oh, it's you like, know, it's I'm like right out of a flying saucer. Like they yeah. have no idea what to do yeah. with you. Yeah. I'm just like, God, I just don't get it. I just, I sit there, scratch my head going, how can people be so like, like, how can they not want like to learn and to, you know, even the people, like I get into people that are like, I'm a Christian and there's people that are Christians out there. But if you get into any kind of thinking past what the Bible says, you know, knowing that the Bible has been potentially, some of it's been rewritten, I'm sure. Yeah. Some of it, has, books have been taken out, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, and they cannot process that. They will not even go there with that kind of thing. Like they, they just shut that right down. And I'm just like, you know, there's a lot that we don't know even about God. There's a lot out there, you know, and in searching for more answers and learning more stuff and kind of keeping an open mind. I mean, I think, you know, you almost have to do that. So I think it's painful for some people. I, I think yeah. it, it yeah. brings up doubts and uncertainties. And that uh, is true. You're right about that, Ash. You're really right about that. And, and I you wish know? that it instead, like I, I wish it would bring up the thirst for knowledge. I, I, I'm, I am happy that doubts and uncertainties for me usually is a path of um, education. Like yeah, that's usually the route that I go is, well, I, I can't get upset about this because I don't have all the information about it. I want to yeah. learn more and I, I want to have a bigger picture. Yeah. And I think some people it's it's unfortunate, but some people, as soon as, you know, there's a, a line of questioning about something that to them is very idealistic. Um, It's scary that the, the fear factor comes into, into that. And 
we know how controlling fear is. So Yeah. You're right. That's a really good way to put it. I just I feel like, you know, like I said this, you know, the other day with with opinions, you know, every time I get an opinion, something comes along and changes it. You know, and it's like I've learned not to really be too opinionated about things because <laughs> it's like I really don't know anything. You know? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the really older I get out. the less I know. That's exactly right. Like I just feel like wow, like all these things I really stood for and I really thought was like, you know, this is the way I feel, this is the way it is. You know, now I'm like, man, I just don't know. It's like everything I'm like, well, you know, I I mean it could be, you know, and that's I'm kind of getting along more along, along those lines where just like, you know, I'm just going on feeling, I'm just going on what feels right for me at this point, you know? <clears throat> so that's all I can do. So, well, you know, the moment you stop doing that, you, you do sort of start putting yourself in, in, in more of a box. Yeah. And, and that gets, for me, that's been always very difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, even when it comes to anything, like if, if someone gives me two things to choose between and they're like, Hey, A or B, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, is there any stops in between? Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard i'm telling you it's it's just getting more of it's like wow it's, i don't know i'm just getting so much more i'm learning so much even this stuff you know the people i talk to with podcasting that the experiences they've had and the encounters and stuff and i'm just sitting here like just sitting there shaking my head going what the hell is going on you know I'm, like what is really going on i've had more happen to me in the last and, and I always consider myself a person that was pretty receptive mm-hmm. like sort of um I, I guess a, 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 you know an antenna for the weird like I, mm-hmm. I had experiences all growing up that were that were unexplainable and um you know some that were corroborated by friends and I always thought like wow you know I've I've, I've led a life that's that's definitely uh, leaning towards the bizarre and then I get older and the last two or three years has has totally uprooted all of that. So even the stuff that I thought was weird, I go back and go, ah, oh, that's that's old hat now. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That's more yeah, textbook it's... weird. This is this is a little bit passing strange. It's getting so extreme though, Ash. Like some of the stuff I've talked to two people this week, actually three, that have had the most bizarre, like some of the stuff they told me. And you, you know, you can hear the emotion in their voice. You can hear the, the passion and the, the, the act. You can hear the truth. You can, you can tell that these people, you know, really experienced this, whether, you know, however they did. I mean, some people can say, well, they must've been, you know, in a different state of mind or whatever. I'm like, no, this is stuff like people break down. They've got PTSD. They've got, you know, this is stuff that's really affecting their lives. Yeah. And I'm just like sitting there like, I can't believe how big this is, how big this is, like how much is going on, how many different, you know, just, I mean, entities, you know, cryptids, whatever you call it, you know, are out there. And, you know, just, just how the scale of this is insane. It's insane. I I think that like globally or or just as, as humans or as modern humans, We've tried so hard to make reality a closed system. Mm -hmm. Like we've tried so hard to make sure that we have everything well-defined, that everything has been, has been researched without the ability to contradict. Like everything that we try to do is we, we try to make sure that everything is labeled. Everything is categorized. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the the modern human is is a human that loves to um compartmentalize yeah and i think that we've tried so hard to do that over such a long period of time now and it's been the wrong model so we get into an age where technology is happening at at a rate that like and i'm not talking about the technology that we're not exposed to i'm, I'm definitely talking about mainstream technology like sell through technology Mm-hmm. is is happening at at such a rate that we don't really have the ability to catch up and we don't really have the ability to understand it right um like when we first started uh we first started our, our journey of personal computing like i'm 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 a big fan of like the history of the internet and history of, of computing 
Um, and I've taught computer science classes. And I always tell my students, like, you know, we, we are living in such an interesting time right now because you are still able to talk to people that had no idea that there was such a thing called personal computing on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon that's not going to be the case anymore. You know, the same way as I, I, we've lost almost everyone that has uh, memories of World War I. Right. So we have these, these epochs of history and everything going forward. I mean, un unless, you know, we have a, some kind of cataclysm or, you know, um, uh, terrorism or, or warfare leans more towards like EMPs and disrupting technology. Yeah. We are heading towards a uh, technology that intersects with spirituality. Like we're, we're getting closer and closer to technology that borders on preternatural and supernatural, like quantum computing, for example. Right, right, right. And it's happened so fast that we've gone from people being able to get a desktop computer, a tower PC, which now even sounds like an outdated concept, like tower PCs sound <laughs> outdated now because okay. everything is cell phone and tablet and, you know, mobile, right? Right. So in a very brief span of time we've went from okay there's this thing called a computer that now actually has home applications like i can budget on it i can draw on it i can game on it i can mm -hmm. make movies on it so we've got this thing that comes along that is sort of life-changing and instantly we want to learn sort of how it works so when you have tower pcs people are able to take these things apart they're able to upgrade them make them more powerful right mm -hmm. And then we get to a point where we get more what's called compact form factor, which is our computers get smaller. Mm -hmm. You know, we want stuff that's more mobile. So I meet more laptops. People start buying less desktop computers. They buy more laptops. And then cell phone technology starts to taking a turn where we become much more social with it and becoming more social with it. We need more power for these social apps and for apps in general and connecting. And all of a sudden you have more people who access the internet and access um, even applications via mobile devices. And, and if it's not a tablet, it's a cell phone. So we've gone from having something that was out of this world to being able to work on it to now being able to not know what to do with it right. in a very short amount of time. Like I ask anyone, like, you know, aside from your screen, do you know anyone that can fix a mobile phone? Right. And right. there's not that many people, but just 20 years ago, if you asked, hey, do you know anyone that can probably fix my my PC? They'd probably got three people for you. Yeah. Um, it was something that was more accessible to normal people and, and now, now the technology is yeah. so crazy yeah they just want you to buy new now with everything it's like that with everything it almost costs you know less to buy new than it does to have something serviced now and i and i almost wonder if that if as we head forward that there wasn't something that was sort of agenda driven in, i was just gonna decision. say that to you i can't believe you just said that <laughs> i was just gonna say what what has always you know piqued my interest is what what is the agenda with all this where are they driving us to and what what's the purpose of all this there's got to be an agenda here for the you know whatever's running the show down here there's got to be something there's a reason for this and what is it so it's extremely distracting mm -hmm. i mean i, I know I that thought, in, and i yeah. fall prey to it too like I, i'm not even out of that loop and i and i wish i was more um me too. I think luckily you and I, I mean, you know, I'm from a generation that, you know, had black and white TV with with rabbit ears. Mm -hmm. Um, So now I I'm not from a generation that can understand what it was like to not have television. It's always sort of been there in my life, mm -hmm. but I've been there for the entire evolution of it. You know, from when we had local local channels which again that technology was a little more accessible to us it's like yeah. okay we got to point the rabbit ears in the direction of where the signals <laughs> the, coming from the three channels there's four there's about right, four right. channels 
<laughs> Nothing was ever on PBS except for Doctor Who. Oh so. my God, Channel Forty Four was my big one. That was the one that was awful, and we had three main stations. And then there was, I think, there was one that did advertising, like Channel Two or something like that. But that was it. It was, you know, God. It was. But just... I look back at like, like the the ritual of that, especially because I'm, you know, I'm a filmmaker. I do a lot of stuff that mm -hmm. revolves around, you know, imagery and, and symbolism and this idea. Of, for me, which is like like the, the ritual of seeing film. And I talk about that a lot with people mm -hmm. that there was a point in time where you would actually dress up to go to a movie theater, yeah. um, which, is, you know, is so far beyond where we're at now. It's so far removed from it that you can't even imagine it, that families would get dressed up because it was part of this 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 ritual. Mm -hmm. We're going to see something that we can't do every day. Um, that we want the whole family to experience. Mm -hmm. It's a narrative that we're unfamiliar with. And we build this sort of ritual around it, you know, right. of getting dressed up and eating the popcorn and going out and having the whole family do it. And it, that even happened sort of with television. I, I remember, um, since I'm a, a big fan of sci-fi films, big fan of horror films in general, and there were midnight movies. And that was a, a big deal for me and my mother growing up was we shared that like she was a huge fan of the fantastic of fantasy and you know she'd be like hey this movie called S -S -S. and it was just sssss -S 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 -S. Mm -hmm. about a guy who turns into a snake is on tonight at midnight okay. so you want to stay up to watch it yeah you know and my little kid brain is like oh i'm gonna stay up yeah yeah <laughs> i think that was probably the, the fastest way to get me to go to sleep was telling me that I was going to be able to stay up. Yeah. And then my brain would betray me. <laughs> and like at 1158, I'm out. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, it, but the idea of like staying up, the idea of having um, an adult activity, you know, where I, I don't have a bedtime and I'm allowed to stay up later and, you know, I'm spending time exclusively like, like with one of my parents, you know, it's, yeah. it's not where we're all in a room and we're sort of dividing our time, but I'm spending exclusive one-on-one -on -one time with one of my parents. And we're talking about the stuff that we absolutely love, which is monsters and, you know, and stuff like that, which <laughs> used to be sort of, you know, like relegated to just a kid realm, you know, and, yeah. and now I think geek culture is so huge that it's, it's, and I love it that, you know, we can be adults and be like, I love monsters. and Dungeons Oh, and Dragons. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh my God. When I was a kid, I loved vampires. I've, I've always had such a, a thing about vampire legends and stuff like that. That was always my favorite. You know, it just, it was awesome. Well, I think once you turn in, you know, into like a, a, that young adult version of yourself, when you get to junior high, like sixth and seventh grade, mm -hmm. you know, the only thing you, the only thing you can think about is, is who's going to turn me into a vampire? Yeah. Well, now the romantic kind, not not the, you know, the real creeped out, you know, crazy, you know, I don't like those kind, but I always yeah, like we don't the, need the like the Max Shrek Nos for us. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The team, well, I grew up in a house. This house was enormous. It was a mansion. I grew up in this this house. If you get online, look up Bush House Estates in Pensdale. Okay. And you'll find the home I grew up in. That's the house I grew up in. And um, we've turned it into like a bed and breakfast for, you know, people. And it made it more commercialized because nobody wanted to live there anymore. Everybody just had their own homes. And, you know, it's, it's a lot to keep up with. So it's turned into something, you know, we do for weddings and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. um, this house is beautiful. And it had like a, a ship room. It had a library. It had, you know, marble uh, fireplaces in every room. Every room, every bedroom had bathrooms. Um, sunken tub in the one with like these gorgeous brass fish handles and like throne looking toilet seats like they look like thrones and um it was just gorgeous we had a circular staircase that was copied from the vanderbilt mansion there was a library there's a wine cellar a butler's pantry you know there's this great big big room that's like the size of somebody's house and um, my nana wanted a, a swimming pool she my nana had the house first and she decided she needed another room in the house instead of an actual, you know, swimming. It was an indoor swimming pool. So she covered it over and we're all just like, oh, yeah, just what she needed was another room in this house. And we all swim. So it was like we would have loved to have this, you know, be a, a, an indoor swimming pool. But oh, yeah. there was like a tennis. They had a tennis court on the property. And then there was like barns. With, it was actually the eighth biggest farm in America when I was growing up because it, it was so weird because it was a farm. And mm -hmm. then on the farm, there were all these houses 
that people lived in, like, like they, they basically, I think they were like back in the day, probably like servants houses. And then there was this Victorian mansion. So it made no sense. Cause usually farms, you have farmhouses, you know, not a Victorian mansion with like barns and although you've got <laughs> horses and stuff like that. So this, the ship room, there's a ship room and you go to, you go up the circular staircase and you look, I'd, I'd always go up and on like halfway up it, there was like landings that went to different floors. And I would go up to my area and my grandmother, I, my grandmother raised me. And so she had her bedroom across from mine and I would always go up to the landing. And in this landing, there was this glass case with like my eighth great aunt. She was dressed in all black. She had black eyes and black hair and white skin. And she just like this real stoic, you know, expression did this, right? this is like this ancient. So I looked at this painting and I'm like, God, this thing is freaky. And then I would always turn up and look at the ship room door before I went into my room and I don't know why, but I was always afraid of the ship room mm -hmm. and I, the mask in the ship room was cop was uh, actually came off of one of King Henry's um, ships. And so my grandmother, one time, I guess there was a leak in the, in the ceiling and she put up my mom. I would go to visit my mom on occasion and she, she'd let me watch vampire movies, which my grandmother never let me watch. Right. So she put up this black garbage bag. She, she taped it up on the doorway and put it, let it into the bucket to, to, until they got the contractors to come in to fix it. Right. And I went up on the landing, turned to the ship room and I just started screaming bloody murder because I thought it was Dracula's clothes. Cloak. Like I, you know, I was. Oh my god! My grandmother came running up the steps. Like, what's right? She started laughing. I was like, "This is not funny, Grandma." I was like, "You should have told me." How you old know? were you, by the way? I was probably like seven. You know, right. something like that. But it was like because I was afraid of Dracula. I, I love the movies, but right. I was still. I would go to my mom's and watch these vampire movies. They come home to this freaking haunted mansion, you know. And then I'd always look at the ship room, thinking that's where something was. And there's this big, like, black cloak looking thing and i'm just oh my god it was awful it was like 10 o'clock at night you know so it was funny but that was just a funny story i just <laughs> I had to tell what i think is great about that is like when we're seven mm -hmm. like we think that that's the kind of dick move that dracula would pull <laughs> Right. right like he has he, although in reality like it, oh. well in, in not reality but the literal the literal or literary reality of dracula He's got access to all of these like books of maidens. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> but, but but late at night, Dracula's sitting there bored. Yeah. Thinking yeah. to himself, I gotta screw with the seven-year-old. <laughs> I, I got to keep this stuff fresh. Oh my God. It's it just unreal. That house should be in a movie. <laughs> that house needs to be used in a movie scene. Like it needs to be. It sounds very cinematic. It it, really you've got to look at it, Ash. It's like I said, it's it, look up the Bush house estate and it's in Pensdale, Pennsylvania, and you will find it. It's, it's gorgeous. You got to see is it, it. Is it still owned by your family? Oh yeah. Yeah. We still own it. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, I'd love to buy it from, you know, the rest of them, you know, just to have it for myself. But I mean, I don't really know if I want to, I don't really want to stay in Pennsylvania. I want to get out of here and, you know, I have got plans to do all kinds of stuff and there's just so many things I want to do. I really want to do some traveling and yeah. I just, you know, I just want to kind of buy a camper for a while, like an RV and just go travel for a while, you know, that's but, on my short list. It yeah, really is. Yeah, I really do. I just want to kind of experience life and stop letting the things I own, you know, or that I've collected own me, you know, and sometimes I just look at things I'm like, man, I'm just so stir crazy. You know, I want to go out and experience things. I don't want to just keep doing the same thing every year and you know, every day, every year. It's a big so. world. And to think of to think of the small amount of of space that that we occupy over the span of a lifetime mm -hmm. um which sometimes i try not to think about that i but, know you know when you do it's like wow there's 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 so much yeah so there much is a us. lot okay you now we're we gotta i would need to hear about your movie and some stuff <laughs> i need to hear some stuff <laughs> okay <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll do the deep dive yes. we'll, we'll get into some stuff now yeah um so let me so we're gonna go in the in the way back machine before the okay. pandemic. 
Okay. And you know, tell that, people that, also that era of innocence. You know, you you've he you've done a movie called Holes in the Sky. Yes. Right. Yes. It's won eleven awards. It's it's been selected at thirteen festivals. Okay. It has won nine awards so far. That's amazing. Thank okay, you. and and the movie's about aliens. Yeah, it's um, you know, I I always try to describe it like, uh, the movie more so than, than anything I think is about like relationships, and um how when people go through something that's very strange and and it doesn't have to be anything supernatural by the way the supernatural is something i'm interested in so that was how i wanted to frame the story but okay. you've got people that go through some very strange strange things in their life like um uh, people who uh you know families were um you know uh, taken to federal court during the red scare just mm -hmm. for example like that's a story that's a narrative that not too many people go through and it's hard for them to find connective tissue with other people. Right. Um, people who have been through hostage situations or kidnap situations, for example, um, people who have been through, and I have, you know, friends of mine who have been through ex extreme abuse, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and not the kind of like, I, I, I'll guess not, not the kind of sort of now popularized, sort of you know mental abuse of name calling and stuff but but the actual um you know brink of death sort of abuse that comes from from finding right. someone that's extremely brutal you know and, and venomous and and sort of wants to hurt you like those people who've been through those extreme situations ag again tend to find themselves in, in very lonely positions right because there's so very few people in their immediate circle and even some of these concentric circles where they try to, you know, expand their reach and, and cast that net. It's, it's very difficult to find people with um, common situations and, 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 and common pasts where you can connect with them. So mm -hmm. a lot of what I wanted to do with this, even though it definitely is sort of about the alien abduction phenomena was that I, I really wanted to ground it in relationships. Okay. Cause I think we get caught up a lot in the, um, the sensationalized aspects of, the fact that we talk about aliens, talk about missing time, you know, we talk about people being born on craft, which is which is fantastic. And I love those details, too. Um, but I think sometimes we forget to talk about the effects that it has on the experiencers around the abductees and yeah. how these people are often very ostracized. They're alienated. They can't feel like they connect to anything and, and how badly it affects their life afterwards. That sounds awesome, actually. That they so, came up with that. Yeah. And and that was, you know, and, and growing up, I had some experiences that were very difficult for me to talk about. And as I got older, you know, I kept thinking, wow, this this really did form who I was. This was a very, you know, um, experience driven upbringing because you find people that maybe, you know, you can't connect to, but, but, but open minded people. And that puts you in different situations and in different cliques and in different circles. So. Mm -hmm. I, I knew that when I, I wanted to now the film that I was going to make before this Tracy <laughs> is a very different film, by the way. Really? Oh yeah. So, and, and this is what we'll go back to that way back machine. It might give you a little more context for why I wanted to do this other film. Okay. Um, so I had written um, a script with another writer locally who I knew and I had produced some films. Like I had produced some feature films um, overseas um, I had produced some small films and I had uh, directed a, a couple shorts and things of that nature. And I had ran a website dedicated to the horror and sci-fi genre for years. So I had always been in those circles, but I'd never really tapped into the ability to utilize it and actually sort of make my own products. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like the organic thing because I love film. I've always wanted to make film. I've always been a writer in, in one capacity or another that I was wanting to, to do a feature. And I did a lot of these shorts and everything. So it was like, okay, we're going to do a feature. And I contacted this guy and, and I said, Hey, you know, you've done some stuff locally. You're within driving distance. You know, we can actually get together and have face-to-face -face meetings and stuff. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that we can sell a script. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, I've got this, this crazy idea that um, I, I think just might work. It's a, uh, it's a comedy. And um, it's about this Canadian offshoot of the Catholic Church that um, believes in this prophet, even though absolutely none of his prophecies have ever come to pass. 
<laughs> like they're just blindly following this prophet. <laughs> and and right before he dies, great. Okay. He he gives them an entirely like the piece of information he gives them is is just totally out of left field. Mm-hmm. Like they're expecting this this grand design. They're expecting something that's going to propel the church forward in the future. And instead, he actually just hands him a matchbook from a strip club. You're kidding me. <laughs> and they look too deep into it. Yeah. And they decide that they're going to send these uh, these these women to infiltrate the strip club because okay. they think that that's where this epic battle between good and evil is going to happen. So they send these these like warrior nuns these, that they've trained mm-hmm. to infiltrate. Canada's um, most premier and yet rural strip club called the Beaver Dam, and and sadly, Trace, we made T-shirts for this as well. So, anyways, oh my gosh! All right, and they've been there now for like seven years, and absolutely nothing has happened except that they've got mild drug habits now. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> this is so twisted all right keep going (laughs) so so lo and behold we sort of shift gears a little bit to a pregnant woman that is hitchhiking across the country and she is pregnant with with the antichrist child oh my god (laughs) and she (laughs) finds her way to the lovely beaver dam strip club in rural Mm -hmm. canada Mm -hmm. and it's an like sadly we put like so many canadian tropes in this like there's a black market maple syrup ring that's running behind the strip club and people are oh my god <laughs> trying to this make sounds like something that. matt would like <laughs> it's like it's, it's horrible and like we we wrote it and and we took a step back and and we're like wow this isn't horrible yeah like, this is really fun it's really funny. It's got like a lot of action in it. And we tried to model the the you know the the nuns as these very sort of cynical but yet, you know, in, intelligent sort of leading women. Right. So, a lot of the humor we tried to get a little higher brow than than what the story called for, which was low brow as possible. Yeah. And we got the script and we looked at it and I I had a friend of mine who um, directed some films for Universal and Lionsgate. And I just like wanted a sounding board because, you know, sometimes you get too close to something, you become very biased. And especially when it comes to art, you know, it's very subjective. Right. And I didn't want to keep looking at this thing, which let's face it, just might've been like a crap sandwich and, right. and think that it's good and put like my money and my time behind it. Like I, I needed someone to look at it objectively. So I needed that sounding board. Yeah. So I, I gave this script to him and I said, Hey, you know, yeah, we can probably knock it down a few pages, but you know, just tell me if I should start taking some accounting classes and change what I'm doing for a living. Yeah. <laughs> and he started reading it and he calls me and he's like, Hey, not only, do I like this? But I think I want to direct it. And I think I want to start casting it. Like, I think we can get. Wow. Well, that's, like, cool. that's <laughs> it was like, that's great. Right. And, uh, you know, so I called my buddy and I said, we need to get, you know, on the phone with this guy and run through what our expectations are. And we need to, you know, if we're just going to be writers or if we're going to try to produce it or whatever, too. Mm-hmm. And it just it took off very, very quickly. We started getting it cast. We um, started having our, our meetings with them. Um, our local SAG representatives so that we could figure out how we were going to, you know, get the usual kickbacks from filming a particular way or another yeah. and how we were going to get this done. And we got the shooting schedule and we were all ready to go. And then uh, the pandemic hit and it just imploded the entire project. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone and all the investors got cold feet. Um, nobody oh, knew no. how and when we were going to be able to shoot. Yeah. That become that became a, a big deal, like a really big deal. It was like, how are we actually going to shoot right. this film? Um, and SAG was changing things very rapidly because they were having to counteract, you know, all the news that was coming through. Right. So 
as, as soon as it became like you didn't have like five people on set at the time um if you were having people um come and go you couldn't do that they they would literally almost have to like live on set um okay. so that you were you weren't risking even more exposure from outside elements right and all of this stuff basically just killed it and it, and a bunch of other things it was like the perfect storm we had a like we had a um, a role strangely enough that um ron jeremy really wanted oh no and, thank and, god right yeah do- yeah now thank god now and like as soon as we started talking to him and as soon as like we were just getting ready to sort of put pen to paper um you know he got involved in some real nasty um legal mess and you know with, with horrible moral implications right and it, it was just everything was happening so everyone in this industry basically tells you like don't worry like listen these things happen all the time like productions get shut down all the time you know ideas that people think are great never get made mm-hmm. like, True. I they hear basically, that too. yeah yep. and they basically tell you don't like don't take it personally like this mm-hmm. this is just the industry it's a hurry up and wait and now stop and now go home and now do something different industry and so the first thing yeah. I did, of course, was took it very personally. <laughs> yeah. Because it was like I was coming so close to sort of achieving this goal of mine. And then no, it just, you, you know, can't you know, give up, though, Ash. You got to keep striving forward with this somehow. Right. But there was a, a tiny little bit of depression that came, you know, from oh, being yeah. really close. And then just um, and then being very isolated all of a sudden. It was like, you yeah. know, talking to a lot of people, getting things together. And then the pandemic hit. And, of course, all of a sudden there was all this isolation. So. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I was going to do. And we had mm-hmm. a couple other projects and we were encountering a, a lot of the same issues, which was um, funding was very difficult mm-hmm. when no one knew where the industry was headed. I mean, even the distribution model for films changed so rapidly and so fundamentally Mm-hmm. Over that time, we had tentpole franchise movies that all of a sudden said they were coming straight to HBO Max. Right. And that sort of never happened. Like we we never thought the new Matrix movie would be on HBO Max the same day that it was in the theaters. And, oh. you know, these huge 200 plus million dollar movies were at risk of, you know, like a horrible ROI, like things just not working out for them. And, I you know, know, it's a bottom line industry. You know, know. it's one of the biggest you know, might still be the single export industry of the U.S. is, is, is film. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely a bottom line industry. And and all of a sudden, that bottom line, um, nobody knew how to get there anymore. And unless you already had something in channel, it was very, very difficult to take a new idea to someone. So we sort of sat there and said, okay, we got to table some stuff because it's just not working. And I was trying to find ways to get some of the other scripts and stuff that I had worked on sort of moving and attach people to it. And, you know, just difficulties, pitfalls, obstacles. And I had always written with the idea of, I have a story, I'm going to write it. And then we'll take a look afterwards and see how much it's going to cost. Right. And sometimes as a script writer, that's great because, you know, you're, you're ultimately getting the, your message across and, you know, you're telling the story that you want to tell. Yeah. At other times, however, you can look and go, this is a $5,000 page. Why in the world did I write this page? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Believe me. Uh, everything yeah, I want to do has like a lot of special effects in it. Oh, oh yeah. God. You know? Yeah. I'm sitting there going, maybe I shouldn't be doing my big <laughs> apocalyptic rabbit film because right. now we got to get rabbit trainers and that's a $50,000 page. Start out with like a Blair Witch Project type thing and go to Steven Spielberg later. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was what we focused on. Like yeah. I sat there and said, okay, let's take, and like, I, I've got to hand it to my wife because we've been together now for almost eight years. Mm-hmm. And there's a point where, you know, I believe she's had to look over and, and be like, this guy is still sort of perpetually 14. <laughs> and, and I am an enabler. Like, I'm sure she's had a few come to Jesus moments. Oh, yeah. Real, real late at night, like watching me snore. Yeah. Like, there's got to be a better way. So, I, I taking pictures I of Jesus. everything to her. <laughs> like, if, if it wasn't for her, I'd be like, alms, alms for the poor. 
Um, yeah, yeah. So she's, she's, she's standing over you in bed watching you snore, thinking, how did I get into this mess? Right, you know, just <laughs> just holding that pillow just an inch above my face. Um, so, oh. so, you know, she's been fantastic. And I looked at her and I'm like, you know, we got to do something. We got to figure out a way to do it. And mm-hmm. late one night we were watching a series on TV that was almost all audio driven. And mm-hmm. we watched almost the entire series. And she would look over me occasionally. She does this, which um, which is, is a great below my self-esteem. God bless her. But she'll be like, why didn't you think of that first? Yeah. Like she says that to me a lot. Like we'll find something new and creative. And she's like, hey, like it's your job to think yeah. face these first. And yeah. I'm like, I'm sorry. And I'm, I'm tripping up a little bit. So <laughs> I, I said, there's got to be a way that, that we can take some of these elements and, and, and make something. And let's sit down and look at our finances, which is never an easy conversation. Right. Like, let's sit down and let's see if we can throw caution to the wind, convince the kids not to go to college and, <laughs> and, and make a movie. Yeah. Like, can, can we self-finance a film? Right. And we came out of it going, you know what? We can make a very small film. Right. Like we can, we can make a very small film where we have to make some very difficult decisions during filming it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, you know, I think, I think we can do that. So we started writing um, this outline. And um, at that time I'd, I'd gone through some, I guess I could only describe as some very like uh, metaphysical transformations in that, that year, year and a half that I was sort of um, looking to find something to do. And I knew that I wanted this story to be very, very different from, from from lesbian warrior nuns was, mm-hmm. you know, my huge focus was on for almost a year yeah and i said you know I, I don't want to do a horror comedy at least not right now i want to do something that's extremely grounded and and we're gonna have to do something different right. um i i know the moment i start trying to cast this film it's gonna go you know out into the the web and and suddenly people are gonna start asking questions they're going to start asking, you know, when release dates are, I'm going to start working with distributors. And I said, I don't think I want to do that. Like, I, mm-hmm. I want to do something completely under the radar. Okay. Like, I don't want anybody really knowing about it. I, I want to do it very local. Um, and we have a, we, we live in, in, a, in a small farmhouse um, that's very removed from civilization. Mm-hmm. And we've had some nights out at the farmhouse where, again, talking about, you know, locations that are very cinematic. It's like, this is the perfect place for a horror film or for a film that has some scares and stuff in it. And we don't have to pay for a location. Like, we can actually film this. Right. In our house. And and the way our house is sort of done up is, you know, or modeled is that there are areas of the house that are very distinctly separate from other areas. Yeah. So I'm like, there's some that have a very open floor plan and there's some that are, are very segregated from the rest of the, the house. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, we can like theme certain areas of the house so that we can shoot as much internal stuff as we need to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, we've got a lot of ways and a lot of land out here that we can shoot some external shots. So I said, I think we can film most, almost this entire film on our property. That would be amazing. And I think we can film it. Uh, with some local actors. And there were a couple actors that I had in mind that I had worked with before. I'd done some commercial work locally. And we tried to get them, and um, it was just scheduling. Like, scheduling was not working. And mm-hmm. we waited, like, six weeks to get the, the actress we really wanted for one of the leads that she even had time to come in for, like, a meeting with us. And, you know, I, I looked at my wife, and I'm like, this isn't going to work. Like mm-hmm. if, if it's taking six weeks to get somebody in for a meeting, I don't think this is going to work. I said, I think we're going to have to act in this movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I, cause we're always around. Right. I'm like, if we need any pickup shots, if we need any B roll, it's like, we can just take the cameras out and do it. Like we've got enough equipment. We can do it here. And I said, you know, I don't want us to be the entire movie. Like we definitely, we, you know, I've got a cast of X amount of people that I, that I have written. Yeah. And we had some friends come over for like tabletop gaming, like once a week. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And one of them 
played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. He was uh, like a dungeon master and, you know, it was very, very in inventive guy. This, this guy, Sean Ed. And he was bringing his um, now fiance over. And I sort of looked at him and I'm like, hey, you guys should act in my movie, <laughs> yeah. even though you don't act. And we've never talked about it. Yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> like I just sort of threw it at him. And he was much more, uh, he, he was much more taken with the idea than she yeah. was. Like it was yeah. deer in headlights as soon as I said it with her. And I'm like, oh, this is, this is not going to be good. But. It, isn't it funny how you would think that most people want to like be movie stars and they'd want to do something to really, you know, just kind of get themselves out there. And there's so many people that want nothing to do with it. <laughs> oh, it was. Yeah. It's like as soon as you're like, hey, here's yeah. a camera. <laughs> They're like, nope. <laughs> they they, they, just, they just pass out. Yeah. It's like they just can't deal with it. That's funny. So I said, listen, just get in front of a camera. I'm just going to mm -hmm. put you in front of a camera. And we had some lines and stuff. And uh, at, at first it really wasn't working. And, and I said, okay, I got a different way. We're going to do some things. Um, I, I'm not going to give you lines. I'm just going to give you beats. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to, because a, a lot of the movie revolves around um, sort of it being part of a documentary where we have interview Q and A's. And, I said, I'm going to give you some beats and I want you to hit the beats and, and just keep talking because we could edit all this down. And what was interesting was that the first, actually the first test shoot that we did with our, our lead actor was when strange stuff actually started happening in the house. Really? Um, we got the camera set up and, and at this point it was just test footage. Like we didn't have our lighting. I didn't have the kind of lens that I wanted anything. It was just like, you're already here. You've got five minutes. I'm just going to bring out one of the cameras and mm -hmm. we're going to get some real sort of crappy test footage. Okay. So we, we get him on there. We're asking him questions. And in the middle of the interview, we've got like this, a, a good size, like colander that we've got hanging on the wall in our kitchen. And it just like propels itself off the wall. And this never happened before. No. We, we've never had any activity in this. We've had things outside of the house, like lights on the tree line, because we're very removed, like from, okay. from any local lighting and as far as city lights. So we had seen some stuff outside the house, but we never had anything happen inside the house until that moment. And he thought that we'd orchestrated it to, to like get a genuine reaction. <laughs> so, I wonder what happened. I mean, I, I know that you know, people bring stuff in and things open doors and such, but it's like something got opened up for you doing it that. Like it. It, yeah. it definitely felt like it. And, and, you know, he was like, Hey, that was great because you guys got a very genuine reaction out of me. And I was like, Oh, now wait till you hear this. <laughs> we did not plan this. So oh, God, he, it, luckily, I mean, everything that we got with this test footage actually ended up looking great. And it was very, very real stuff that was happening. All the reactions we were getting were very genuine. And we started talking about things that we were looking to happen. Like, um, we sort of had this, this idea where when our lead character sort of gets more upset, um, when things start to escalate, that the electricity in the house starts to, to, to fail on multiple mm -hmm. levels. Like cameras start failing, um, you know, the actual electricity in the house starts failing, et cetera. So it escalates. And when it escalates, it, it goes to these levels of ele electrical failure. And we started talking about that. And we noticed that we'd get close to, to doing a scene and the lights in that room would start flickering. Wow. And that's crazy, Ash. That really is crazy. Keep going. It was very, it was very strange the first week that we started uh, filming. And this was like our heavy conversation weeks. Like it was a lot of, here's what I want the character to do. Here's how we're going to shoot this. Here's the people that we need. You know, here's what we're spending our money on. And I was trying, I had to sort of involve everyone in that. Um, because almost everyone was almost in every scene. Mm -hmm. And the very, very conversation heavy period. And we'd be back in my office area and um, we have a, like a little steampunk thing going on with my wife's office area. And like this steampunk vanity mirror just fell like just 
right off the wall. Um, we'd go into another room and um, a painting we'd have, boom, fall off the wall. So I really was, at a loss on this one. This is odd. It was very, very strange <clears throat> um, to the point that we, we almost thought just because of the, the, the energy that we were sort of spending on this, if it had something to do with, with like thought forms, like we were sort of putting out yeah. this idea of creating our own mythology and our environment was starting to respond to it. Yeah, exactly. Like you're creating it just from thought. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's, that's all. That's what they were referring to the rake yesterday in a podcast. And the one guy wrote that it used, it was like, you know, a, a, a an urban legend and it's basically become a true thing just from, you know, making it yeah, up. And, and, and I've heard of a couple of people who have, um, and this was, you know, um, tests that were done, you know, 15, 20 years ago where people would, you know, create an urban legend, uh -huh. put people in a house, um, give them a Ouija board, um, you know, give them tools for spirit communication. And they would end up having these very real experiences, you know, based off of this fake legend, you know, the thing that they created. Just from thought. It, it, it really leads you back. Well, it is mind blowing because it leads you back into the biblical sense where the Lord tells people that our thoughts are so important and people don't, they just don't understand that. They don't think that everybody feels their thoughts are private and that they're just thoughts that, you know, we don't realize the energy that actually could be created from them. I think that we have this innate ability that, you know, unfortunately we, we haven't spent thousands of years refining. You know, mm -hmm. if we had, um, civilization might be completely different. Looking at stuff now on the subatomic level, like double slit theory, the fact that these experiments are, they're observer dependent. You know, if you think mm -hmm. that, you know, more photons are going to go through one slit than the other, then it happens. Um, there's definitely something there. And we had Jeez, conversations we think, about that. We can think ourselves into being pretty rich and looking pretty good then. <laughs> No kidding, right? I'm not kidding. I might even start practicing this. You know how badly I've wanted wings for like ever? Oh my God. You and me both. That's the one <laughs> thing I want more than anything is to be able to fly. Just give me wings. Just give me some wings. I or want wings levitate. too. Otherwise. That's, that's where my no, energy is going now. I mean, after this talk, man, you just motivated the crap out of me. I'm going to be starting to, I'm going to start doing some meditation here every night. Oh, so, the mantras uh, I'm chanting for the next month? Yeah. <laughs> I'm over serious. Somebody's house. Yeah. <laughs> Might be doing uh, it uncontrollably. Still. Just crazy. I'm telling you. <laughs> so, okay. So, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry so, we, we started experiencing these things, and, and it became a little commonplace, and then uh, I think the less conversations we had about what we we're wanting, what we we're trying to do, that activity started to die down mm -hmm. and, it, and it just got back into um, us just shooting the film. Okay. And what's, what's very interesting about this whole process was that I brought a lot of people in who weren't involved with film. Mm -hmm. And I think that when most people hear that you're shooting on your own property, you're shooting with non-actors, you're <laughs> shooting with your own money. <laughs> It, it yeah, is like, funny, uh, you know, but it's it's how things get, you know, started. So right. It it either sounds like they're gonna get to your property and everybody's putting on like really crude paper mache masks. Yeah. And they're like, okay, here's the monster. Or they're gonna get to your property and it's all just gonna be bait and switch. You're gonna be like, get in the box, Lucy. You know, it's gonna be something horrible right. like that. So right. it, Either it's like accidental pornography or just really bad movies. Like they, they don't know what they're getting into at all. Oh my and God. So once we start filming some stuff, like I knew that I had to start editing footage. Like I had to show them that this yeah. was not, that this wasn't horrible. Right. <laughs> like I had to give them something tangible to really yeah. like motivate and excite them. So I had about eight minutes that I had cobbled together that was luckily at the beginning of the film, even though we didn't shoot the film in a linear fashion, I had eight minutes that I could get together for, for this beginning. And um, I, I put it together and I said, okay, I really want you guys to see what we're making. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I need you guys to see that there's, there's vision here and that we've got an end game. Mm -hmm. And I brought them all in and I showed them the eight minutes and they were like, 
this is like a movie. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, well, yeah, that's what we're making. Mm -hmm. We're making a movie. They're like, no, it's like a movie movie. Yeah. Like, this is something that I would like turn on TV and watch. And I'm like, well, that's that's the idea. If we can make a small movie that looks like a big movie and looks like it was made for millions of dollars when it obviously wasn't. Right. Then, you know, we can we can get competitive. Yeah. So we um, it's Sean and, 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 and Stacy who are now um, engaged and, and, and going to be married. Mm -hmm. um, and then my wife and myself and a group of other people that were able to bring in all did this this film over a period of about two or three months was about what it took to shoot as we were working around everyone's with that with, with being non-actors a lot of people we were working around their nine to fives and their family <laughs> lives and mm -hmm. children and stuff so it wasn't like we could just say you know here's your shooting schedule be on set it was more like a <laughs> what are you doing thursday <laughs> you available <laughs> thursday <laughs> you know you'd be people would be surprised at how much you know how rough some of this stuff is even in the professional like you know the the high ups like how you know it's really comical like how normal and, and just you know like, and i don't know just i don't know how to put this into words but it, it's just really it's comical to me when you hear about how things are made and how they oh, get started it, it, so. it, to it totally we had like a couple like 16 year old kids out there were mm -hmm. like okay now we're gonna do this in post mm -hmm. but we need you out here in a black unitard so here you go <laughs> it reminds me not to interrupt you but we had to do the shoot for the tlc channel for the for the family and or it was just me and my three my two daughters and we had this huge Fight. we had an enormous fight before the shooting and it was just so funny we're running around getting ready and trying to get all dressed you know dolled up and makeup and all stuff and we're just fighting with each other like everybody's <laughs> at each other's throat you know and then just boom you're on camera and we're all just lovey dummy and acting like everything's great <laughs> It's it's, it's, a, it's a weird duality. I mean, it's so bizarre. It, it is really so is. funny. Like we're just like people do not understand. Like you just you know like it. And you had to like you were saying you had to be on the one day. I told you I was like I was dreading you know doing a podcast that day. I just got I was like oh I just don't I can't do this today. And but I did it anyway and I got through it. And it was great. But you were like you know you have to be on. You know and I'm like I know. So oh, yeah, it's just it, funny. It, it, like real you life know? always comes in. It, it's like. Yeah, you you never think that. I mean, until you get older, of course. But like when you're young, you never think that anything is going to revolve around somebody having diarrhea. You just don't <laughs> right. think that that's something. Even a thing. Yeah, <laughs> like you, you don't think that you're ever going to get up and go. I know my schedule is gonna is gonna shift today. Yeah, because you know things are happening south of the border. Right. So, yeah. But, you know, like when you get older, you start. <laughs> like you know there were, there were there were nights where it was like okay i'm i can't eat too much pizza like <laughs> if we're <laughs> i'm now I'll be bloated old. in the morning right like i'm officially old <laughs> yeah and it's my responsibility to not eat as much pizza as i want to yeah because i want to eat all of it yeah but i cannot yeah so i know it's crazy but anyway God, i'm sorry i just <laughs> cracked me up when i was thinking about that yeah it really is like we I, surprisingly we had like fewer you know like nights of air like it, it wasn't a, a real comedy of errors like you would expect it was mm -hmm. a, a lot like it was a lot easier than we thought we we got tons of really good stuff shot and mm -hmm. like i i've taught um film production i've taught um special effects for film and everything on the college level so i said you know our overhead is considerably less because a lot of this is sweat equity on my part Mm -hmm. you know i was behind the camera i was in front of the camera like i'm gonna edit this thing i'm gonna color grade it um yeah. i'm gonna do the special effects like you know we're we're gonna do you know what we can with it but i but i said you know i've been doing this professionally for such a long time that we're gonna try to make it as competitive as possible like yeah you know i i i luckily it, well, there wasn't a lot of learning curve too which was great that's awesome so, we weren't making mistakes as we went along. So we had the movie and, you know, I, I, I edited the film and I said, Hey, I'm going to have everyone come out to our property and we're going to, we're going to get a projector out 
and we're going to project the movie on the side of the barn. So mm-hmm. we got a couple old barns out here. I said, we'll put up a screen and everything. And um, like we had we, people come out and meet. We're going to have it catered and all this stuff. Like we're going to have a private screening of the film. And only one or two people had actually like seen the close to finished product. And even that was without the score and everything. Mm-hmm. We had a, a great guy, this local guy, Brian Jones, who, who'd done some film work previously, had come in and done the score for us, which, you know, as you know, can can make or break a film. Mm-hmm. And he was really good at, you know, establishing the tone that we wanted in the atmosphere. And we're very, very happy with the music and everything. So we brought all the people out onto this property to watch the film. Now, they had also brought like their families. So the, and their families had seen nothing of this. Like, like they they didn't even know their parents were acting. Oh, wow. They knew okay. so very little. So they brought their families out here. And, you know, we're trying to gauge reactions. Like we're looking like, are people sitting on the edge of a seat? Are they gasping mm-hmm. during certain parts? And I remember at the end of the film, like someone came up to me and they're like, my teenage daughter didn't want to walk to the car by herself. Good job. <laughs> Well, that's a good sign, unfortunately, <laughs> to say. Good job. And I'm like, oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And we we started looking at the project a little bit differently because uh, through a lot of the production, one of the, the main points that I kept telling people was that this is this is proof of concept. I want to be able to take this to, to other studios and say, this is what I can do on a self-financed film. Look at what this crew can do. You know, if you send a, a few hundred thousand dollars our way. Yeah. So we didn't know the film was really going to have that much of a life. But after we edited it and we screened it, we're like, no, there's something here. So I said, you know, let's go ahead and do the, the festival circuit. Like, let's do the, the whole festival season. And and I'm like, I'm a, a, a very optimistic person. But I, but my my the side of me that's a realist is always at battle with that. Yeah, me so too. I'm the exact try, same way. Yep. Right. And you got to try to find the happy medium. Yeah, where you're optimistic, but it's not so much that you get horribly disappointed. Yeah. So, I was talking to the cast and the crew and everything, and I'm like, "Listen, I'm I am going to submit the film to festivals, just to let you know. Like, I I had a, a distributor lined up already, mm-hmm. um, just from being in the industry for so long. Like, as soon as I had something completed, they were like, let 'Let's take a look,' and they're like, "No, we can do this.' But I said, you know, I don't just want to put this film out. Like, I definitely want to." have people see it like I, I i want this to be an audience you know an, an audience viewed film like i i want this idea of seeing it in theaters and stuff right. so i started submitting it to, to film festivals and i told the whole cast i'm like don't expect anything like it's very competitive for feature films yeah a, a lot of these films that are submitted to film festivals um either are either have studio backing or they've got a ton of money behind them right so I said for a very small, small film like ours, um, I said, just don't expect anything. So, you know, here I am <laughs> deflating their hopes and dreams. Yeah. <laughs> and I was well. supposed to be like, you know, the fearless leader. And I'm like, just, you know, I have. No, you're leader. preparing them for, you know, to not be overly, you know, excited if it you know to expect too much and then if something greater happens then it's even better you know that's how i look at it so yeah, and, i would and i was that. and a lot of them it was, it's their first time really doing something like this you know and i didn't want the expectations of of a like a racks to riches kind of story you know because yeah. it's just it's, it's a very competitive industry and you can get bad reviews from people who just have a bad day i know i know so, so and you're always going to get some reviews that are bad. There doesn't matter. I don't care what it is. There's always going to be somebody that has to say something negative. You, you no. just, you know, interestingly enough, it, it could be anything. It could like, be anything. Why in the world does that guy right. have a knitted cap on? Throughout I, know. That movie? I know. I know. I mean, it could be E.T. or Titanic or something. And there's people that just say, you know, oh, it's terrible. Or, you know, you know, Barbara Streisand's voice or something. You know, like, yeah. you just, actress was gaunt, always, and yeah, you know. was, was gaunt, too thin, <laughs> shrill voice. F. It's always something. So there's always, always some guy, not enough yeah. pizza in film. It's like, well, I couldn't eat all that pizza. I told you. Anyway, so God. <laughs> but that's, it, that's what you deal with. 
Mm-hmm. And I sort of try to prepare them for that too. I'm like, ah, I've had some bad reviews and stuff that I've done, and I've had positive reviews, and you got to take them in stride and, and balance it. So yeah. I said, don't expect a whole lot. And then all of a sudden, it was like, oh, by the way, so we're an official selection at this festival, just letting you guys know. And then, like, a day later, I'm like, by the way, we're an official selection at another festival, just letting you guys know. Wow. And then it became like six festivals. Mm-hmm. And it was a wide range from Arizona to New York um to oh, uh, kentucky um how oh, jeez uh, uh wisconsin um iowa like they all started coming in and so then i had to switch gears and be like we're not gonna win any wars <laughs> so that was my next yeah yeah my, yeah my my deflation pep talk right my anti i would have done yep yep was like just letting you know we're not gonna win any wars like we it's a it's just an honor to be nominated you know it, it was that speech this is so honor, me honor this is exactly what i would be doing too yeah <laughs> right and everybody's like you're really supposed to be building this up and i'm like just stop <laughs> just i don't stop want to be crushed optimism. okay stop with your super optimistic face right now because <laughs> i'm telling you it's just too good to be true. Yeah. One of us will die tragically before his video. So it's like, I was just very ominous and horrible about the whole thing. And God, that is so <laughs> me. That's so funny. Okay. So they're all expecting, you know, like, we're not going to win anything. And I'm like, we're not. It's like these films, like, I can't believe that we're in a film festival <clears throat> with a film with like established actors in it. Right. Right. Like That was, you know, surreal enough as it was. Oh, yeah. So then it starts getting closer to some of these festivals. And there were a couple of of pretty big ones. And all of a sudden, it was like I got an email. Like, you're nominated, you know, for for an award. So, you know, do you guys want to come to the festival? So then I had to have the next talk with them. You know, like talk. (laughs) Like I was like a Sunday school teacher or preschool teacher. Like, if you drink all that punch and you run around. You're gonna puke, like that was the <laughs> like the dad standing in the corner, you know, standing in front of all the kids, sitting down, looking at you with big eyes. Right, yeah, and then sitting out the one kid now. Look who peed his pants. I told you, <laughs> don't drink all that punch. Oh, so God. I add everybody. I'm like, okay, so we got nominated for a couple of things, mm-hmm. and they're like, well, what? And I'm like, just a couple things. One of them we were nominated for for best feature, and they're like, what? And I'm like. Don't get your hopes up. You're like, calm down. These people are professionals. <laughs> so we went to a couple of these, we went to a couple of these festivals and, you know, we, we screened the movie and, um, you know, a, a lot of the cast was there. Um, Brett Blakely, who plays um, the, basically the, the cameraman and one of the crew in, in the film was, was there. And, um, Sean Ed and um, Stacey Britton and my wife Chanel. So the, the core cast is there and we like win best horror feature. Right. And then I'm, I'm like, okay, so this happened, which is pretty crazy. And then they pull me aside and they're like, just letting you know, like you, you won best director. Jesus. And, and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Like This is amazing. <laughs> this is such a great story. And it's awesome. it, and it just sort of you know it it, it kept up like the the momentum because a lot of the festival season is about uh middle of september through middle of november like that's your bulk of almost all your festivals right um so you know we got into more festivals and then there was a, a big one in lexington kentucky um called scare fest and they have a lot of actors there it's um they even have like a they call it the black carpet because it's horror, you know, centric, but mm-hmm. they have a red carpet dealio. And, you know, and I got a call and they're like, Hey, you know, that you're at, you know, at the festival screening the film. And I'm like, yeah. And they go, you're up for best feature. So do you guys like want to come do the red carpet? thing? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Like, nobody knows who I am. Nobody knows who I am. <laughs> So one of the other right, one of the other actors, this guy Doug McDonald, did a great job. He plays like an interviewer. <clears throat> he plays like a uh, a network corporate sort of you know guy. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, you know, almost everybody's come to a couple of these other conventions. Do you want to come to the one where we do the red carpet? 
And he's like, yeah, you know, I definitely want to come. And he came with me and we're standing there and um, like they start, you know, giving like the, the cast of like ghost hunters was there um, like Bruce Campbell and a bunch of well-known, like, you know, horror movie actors are there. Mm-hmm. So they're going through this red carpet thing, you know, they're telling us to stand and we're sort of hobnobbing with some of the actors acting like we belong there. Mm-hmm. And, and they're like, ah, from the evil dead films and Ash versus evil dead and all this other stuff, or please believe it or not, you know, Bruce Campbell and like, and Ted Raimi from all this other stuff. And they're like director Ash Hamilton. And I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. Like, why did you let me in? Like, <laughs> because you belong in. there now. All these credits. So we go through the red carpet and I'm like, I got to make this somewhat memorable. So I acted like I was looking for the bathroom. I'm like, that is probably more believable than that I just got stuck here. So I just I started asking where the bathroom was and got a lot of laughs. But um, mm-hmm. it was really great. And we did end up actually winning Best Feature there. That's amazing. So we got a couple Best Features. We've got... A lot of other things that are in our nine awards. We were able to uh, bring them our audience favorite award actually for our local film festival, which was great because I really wanted there to be some local support for this because, you know, every dime that we put into this, we put into it locally. You know, we wanted to keep everything in sort of a hometown kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and right now we're just uh, we're on like the second phase, which is looking for reviews to come in. Mm -hmm. um like the more reviews we get to come in from you know established press then we can get onto something like rotten tomatoes and you know and and be able to get more of an established presence there so that's sort of the second phase of our marketing and then once that's sort of through then we'll get back with some of these distributors and look at where we're going to be and and what streaming um you know situations we're going to be in as far as public exhibitions and that stuff Mm mm-hmm and so the name of it's Holes in the Sky, correct? Yeah, it's Holes in the Sky. The full title is Holes in the Sky, the Sean Miller story. Um, okay. So officially, if you were to <laughs> talk about the film, it is a it's a film about a documentary about a failed documentary. Okay. I think so I, get, I know what you're getting at. Of levels there. Where and the film revolves around a uh, an incident in 2013 where this guy um, Sean Miller, who had had some previous um, abduction experiences, goes missing for about four days. There is a, a manhunt for him. He comes back. Um, people don't necessarily believe a story. There were a couple of um, incidences where he had talked about leaving. He had talked about um, an affair he had with his wife, and unfortunately, it it sort of took that story and and put a negative spin on it and he was ostracized um not only that but he was sort of publicly humiliated and sort of went into hiding Mm -hmm. moved from where they were and moved around over the period of about seven years and i sort of put my own story into it where i'm coming off of a failed movie production I'm trying to do something different. And I decide I'm going to do this documentary about these events in 2013 with this guy, Sean Miller. So I'm trying to find him. Um, We have a couple of almost like Mandela effect instances where I'm not finding associated press articles that I thought were there. I'm Mm -hmm. not finding emails. We're starting to question just how much of this was maybe a put on or publicity stunt back in 2013. And eventually I get contacted by Sean Miller. I find an email address and, and Sean Miller, wow. played by Sean Ed, um, agrees to have us film for five days at, at this house. Mm-hmm. And what we don't realize is that he's been still having um, abduction experiences and they've escalated since they've been in this new home. Since the home is so remote. Okay. And we get there and instantly things start happening. And what's interesting for people who have, who have interviewed me now is that if you watch the film, those first couple of days actually have that test footage where we caught stuff flying off the wall. So that's we amazing. Left it in the film. Oh, that's great. So that's we are great. actually presenting a, a partly fictional film based on true events that actually has what we consider genuine activity in it. That's amazing. So it's weird. It's all these different, it's like an onion, it's an onion of a movie. That's amazing. And um, yeah. thank you. And um, what ends up happening is that these events, the um, the abduction related events start escalating. We find things out that Sean has kept from us. 
that um, definitely put a different spin on the documentary. Um, and then it culminates in a 911 call. So oh. there's a lot in the film that talks about this 911 call. So there's a lot of foreshadowing where everything's leading up to this 911 call. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't really know what happens during it um, until you sort of reach the moments of the 911 call and then those elements are revealed. And the movie that you're seeing, Holes in the Sky, is the idea that um, someplace like Netflix or Hulu, or whatever, got a hold of the story and they did their own film about it. Okay. So you see what looks like interviews with myself, interviews with um, the, the police on the scene, interviews with the 911 operator. So we definitely do it like a full blown documentary. This sounds fascinating. I have to well, watch this. Well, I, I am going to send you a screener link because I, I think you'd enjoy it. I would love to watch this. Yeah, I'll watch it with my son. He would love it. And my daughter, actually. They're both here. I mean, living with me, <laughs> not here with me right now. But yeah, that would be amazing. Well, and, and we've had, like I said, we've had some really, really good responses to it. We've, you know, had some people approach us. And, and there were a couple of instances where we've had people, like, approach us who it was just me there. And they're like, so what happened? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're like, what happened? And I'm like, we don't understand this is fictional. And they're like, what? Yeah. And I'm like, no, this it's not all this happened. Right. So right. we're getting some people that are, it, it, we believe that we did it in a way that it is very earnest and very believable. Yeah. So, and I, and I hope that when you watch it, I hope that comes across because we worked very hard on that angle of it to get people wrapped up in the story to the point where they do question whether it's fictional or not. That's 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 cool. I'm excited to see it. I really am. I, I'm I know. I want your opinion on it. Yeah, I'd like to see it, and yeah, I would love to. I I'm just this stuff is so fascinating to me anyway. You know, so it it just would be. And have you ever had encounters like when you were younger, or you had talked about going back, and then we kind of got into the film too. But I I I didn't want to miss that part where you started to talk seemingly about some encounters you had when you were young. Yeah. So um. We lived during my youth in um, a very small town. Mm -hmm. Um, Until I actually moved to New York, I was almost always in small towns. Um, And I think when people watch films or people watch series and they see small towns, like one instance is a very popular series, Smallville, that was on for about 10 years. Smallville, as a small town, is still 52,000 people in the series. Mm Mm-hmm. I grew up in a town of 450 people. I know. Right? I know. Yeah. Yep. Like village. That, They're more like a village. Yeah. You know? Quintessential small town. And it's in the Midwest. So in the Midwest, what you commonly get, because it's it's farmland, is you'll get um, a, a small town and get a village of 450 people. But the nearest town is not for another nine miles. Mm-hmm. So unlike like New Jersey and New York where I lived. Yeah, there's small town atmospheres, but it's really just one big suburb to the city. All these towns are sort of interconnected. Right. But the traditional Midwestern small town is an isolated burg. It, it's it's totally removed from any kind of, you know, nearby metropolitan environment. It's extremely rural. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I had lived in towns of 450 people, 600 people. And the town that I grew up in was a small town called Fairmount, Illinois. And again, it had a school that actually could not be sustained by the local population. So that school was shut down and there was a consolidated school outside of town, which had to bring in about four towns to get enough kids for the school to actually be purposeful. Right. So, (laughs) yeah. That's sad. Right? It was just crazy to think of, you know, because Smallville is yeah. about 52,000 people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's really no industry. Like, you're you're driving to your jobs unless there's, like, a grain mill or something that you work at in these towns. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we lived on the last road out of town, a little cul-de-sac. And behind us was the old elementary school that had never been torn down. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kept in relatively decent shape for what reasons I don't know. Maybe some, somebody owned the property and, you know, thought they were going to convert it into maybe like a, a public service building or something at one point. 
um, but it still had a functional playground. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, what we used to call tornado slide, um, a Jack and Jill slide. This is very like 80s terminology. Yeah, yeah, here. yeah. You know, this is this is hardcore old school playground terminology. You know, <laughs> only the playground gang kids knew this stuff, Tracy. <laughs> so, digging deep. <laughs> so we had this playground behind our house, a little ranch house that I grew up in. And I remember one night waking up because my room, uh, the the, the, the back wall of my room had a small window and that window was facing the playground in the school. Uh -huh. And I remember waking up and I'm looking out that window. And, I, and the first thing I think to myself is, is why is there a child out there? Oh boy. I mean, this was two o'clock to 33 o'clock in the morning. It's, of course it is. It's and always. Course, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The witching hour. It rises. It's never like, so at 10 53 AM. Nope. That's when the weird shit start happening. Um, <laughs> it's like brace yourselves because once noon comes, this place gets creepy. So. <laughs> <I know. laughs> no, it's, it's always two. It's like three, basically you know, two thirty to three thirty is like you know it's just the the hell hour, you know. Exactly. So. It's like bring a change of pants. <laughs> All the portals open up then. Because we just <laughs> They're all just standing in front of those doorways. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway. Yeah. 1 15 p.m. All hell's going to break loose, kids. So we're... you wonder why we're all asleep. At, why we're all, most people want to be asleep at that time. Oh, exactly. You know? yeah. We just sleep right through. And if everybody could put, imagine if everybody had cameras put in their house or on them when they were sleeping, the crap that we would see. Oh, yeah. I was sitting at my like... piano. I told this story already. I was literally just a couple weeks ago. I was sitting at my piano and I turned around and I was just sitting there and all of a sudden my drink slid across my freaking end table. Oh, wow. And I was like, okay. Like I just, and I didn't even hardly react. I just kind of chuckled. I was like, wow. And then I, that's what I thought. I was like, imagine if I put a camera on myself when I was sleeping at night, you know? Oh yeah. So there'd be some pretty freaky stuff. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm also sure there'd be a lot of just my wife staring at me and shaking her head. <laughs> oh, my God. My son said he didn't want to know. He's like, don't you dare, Mom, because I don't even want to know what's around us when we're sleeping. Right, yeah. That, some of those noises might be a haunting. Some That's of them not... might be just a regular nocturnal emission. Oh, my God. I'm telling you. Anyway, so so you saw so you're out, so you saw something out your window? Yeah, and um, it was a child. You know, there was a child out there, I'd say, probably around my age. Yeah. Which at the time would have had to have been about seven. Mm -hmm. I'd say about, about six or seven right around there. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, first of all, the first thing that I thought, strangely enough, was jealousy. Because they let this little kid out. Like in the middle mm -hmm. of the night to play in the playground. I'm like, well, my parents obviously suck. Because I should be out there at two o'clock in the morning on the Jack and Jill slide. Yeah. And instead there's this kid. And then the second thing that what I thought was 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 bizarre was that um there was a light on him but I I couldn't see where the light was coming from like it looked like a street light or you know just a um rural yeah. places have a lot of post lights and stuff and I thought well I just can't see the, I can't see where the light's coming from uh -huh. you know I just he, but he was illuminated and I think that even as a child, sometimes we have the ability when we look at another child that has mm -hmm. that we can sort of sense it. Right. That there's like something, something is wrong, you know, or, or something is different about this other child. And yeah. I was overcome with this sensation that um, I don't think this is a kid. Like it looks like a kid. Like for all intents and purposes, this looks like another child, but like I, I got this very distinct impression that I was looking at um, something like masquerading as a child. A child yeah. And, and and that strangely enough, it was when I, I realized that the child was 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 looking back at me. So I'm looking oh, at my. this child, and the child's looking back at me, <laughs> and and that's my my last memory that I have of that event. 
Oh, no, Ash. And I do know that it started a lifetime of sleepwalking, sleep talking. Uh, I had pretty consistent night terrors until um, a few years ago when I when I went through a kind of therapy that sort of lessened those night terrors. I still have them, but they're definitely not as frequent as they used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I had had some weird instances where some of that stuff was corroborated. I um, was engaged to a girl when I was much younger in my early 20s. And I remember waking up and she was already awake because the entire house was just flooded with light. And we had oh. no idea where the light was coming from. Oh. And and I remember her being so disturbed by it that we could never have a conversation about it. Every time that I would bring it up because I was very I was more curious. Yeah. Because yeah. I had had experiences, but never with someone there. Right. So it was someone there. It was like, please, I'm going to talk about this because I've yeah. never been able to talk about this before. And now I can. My God, it sounds like you've had abductions. That almost classically is 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 what it you know sort of fits into. Right. It really does. It really does. It sounds like that was the beginning of your abductions, and and then it just escalated into other things. And and a lot of it was very stereotypical sort of textbook abduction experiences. My mm-hmm. uh, grandmother collected um like small porcelain owls. Mm-hmm. And, and I used to love going into this room that was just totally adorned with her collectibles. And it was almost all owls, like, you know, barn owls and snow owls. Mm-hmm. And I was very taken with that room when I was a child until after that incident. And yeah, the owls are the room... portal. They're supposed to be a portal. Um, I don't want to go into I don't I don't want to say the word demonic, but it's some kind of a portal. It's a it's a symbol for it. And and, and at that point, I started to become terrified of that room. Um and this, unfortunately, seems to be something strangely generational. Um, we had had a painting of owls in the house that uh, one of my wife's friends had had done. Mm-hmm. And it started to be, become an, an issue where my son um, would break down at the side of the painting. That is really crazy. And kept talking about the eyes. My dad yeah. told my aunt to get rid of her owl statue because it was a portal. Huh. Keep yeah, go, keep going. So she didn't want to remove the painting. My wife did because it was from a good friend of hers. Mm-hmm. So we actually had another artist um, paint the eyes closed. And that was the only way that my son could actually look at the painting. So Alien eyes. Like an alien, like an E.T. eyes. Yeah. Yeah, as remind um, you of ET possibly or at one oh. point I remember my mother taking me into it was like a, a, a borders or a Walden books because at one point in time every mall had a bookstore, right? Mm-hmm. Which I think was great. Yeah. Every mall had a bookstore at one point in time. And half the time it was like a big store. And yeah. I had walked into one of the, the local chains. And I, well, I think it was a national chain, but it was Walden Books with my mother. And they had a um, a small display of Whitley Strieber's book, Communion. And yeah. I had a very adverse reaction to it. Hmm. And I was very unable to articulate what my problem was with it. Have you my thought mother... about hypnosis? I'm sorry? Have you thought about hypnosis? I have considered it. I, I've considered it multiple times. I had talked to someone about it. And the conversation that I had had with her was that she didn't think it was a good idea. Okay. Um, and not that that would be my, my last take on the situation. Right. I mean, I I would still definitely consider it. Maybe with somebody that's really experienced with it. Yeah. You know, Um, so that, that still, I feel is an option for me. I mean, especially because my, uh, my, my sleep for the the longest time has, has been extremely disrupted. Yeah. So, I mean, I would love just to have a, a great night of sleep, to be honest with you. You know, regardless of what the source is, it's like the idea of having a, like a great eight hour sleep is Did, almost are you, out of my hands at this point. 
are you a Christian or do you have any beliefs in God? I, at one point in time, and this is previous to some events that happened about three years ago, was a very vocal atheist. Oh, that's right. You told me that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. My father, my biological father, who was, who was no longer in my life, um, was a very vocal <laughs> atheist, even though my mother is a very vocal Christian. Um, so okay. there was this weird dichotomy growing yeah. up when it came to that. And I think that my my father didn't really entertain any of it. Um, I wouldn't talk about it around my mother, but, you know, on a one on one basis, it was always very distinct that my father was was definitely an, a very convinced atheist. OK. And um, I, I I think for the longest time, I thought I was smarter than everyone, you know, especially when I was in my, like my early oh, 20s. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had all the answers. And that usually goes uh, along with atheism or agnostic. Yeah. 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 And it just reinforced that. And um, some instances happened sort of peppered throughout probably my late 20s and early 30s, leading into my 40s, that um, sort of opened me up to be more of an agnostic. Mm -hmm. um, things that I definitely couldn't explain, things that had um, a, an otherworldly quality that lent itself more to a source or a godlike presence. Yeah. So I started to be more open to the idea that, that maybe I didn't have the answers. Maybe I didn't really have it right. And you mm -hmm. know, that I had more to learn. And um, then I started having <laughs> some more dream episodes and sleep episodes. Um, starting at about three years ago that have continued to this day that mm -hmm. um, because of, certain information that, that I got in these episodes and and the way that I was able to verify and confirm the information with other people mm -hmm. um, has now led me to believe that I, I wholeheartedly believe that there is an afterlife and that we do receive communications from it. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I asked you this, um, I, I was having some disruptive sleep and what I started doing I was just talking to another girl that I was going to, I'm going to have on one of my episodes or one of my podcast shows here. Um, I started playing, I have a TV in front of my bed because I need to drown out um, spirit activity and stuff. I get, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a medium in a sense, I guess, or whatever it is. I'm like a freaking de or beacon of light for these things, but they just don't leave me alone. Right. And you just have to experience it to understand what like, you have to understand, you have to live it to understand how crazy it can get. And I have to keep noise on or have to have somebody in the house with me at all times. Usually if I'm alone in a house, I get just bombarded with stuff. And so I started to play the Bible. When I go to bed at night, I put on a, a like a loop of Bible verses. It can be healing verses. Mm -hmm. It can be verses to ward away evil. It can be, you know, like if you're sick, I'd recommend putting on healing verses. If you're, battling if you feel like you're battling some kind of a dark entity then put on you know uh verses for protection things like that so i play it really low it's probably at like a maybe seven i always pick seven i like i hate the number six i'm really weird with numbers mm -hmm. and i everything has to be certain numbers like i can't stop exercising unless it's like out of five or a seven or i don't know why i'm like this it's a really weird thing like a rain man type thing or something i'm not sure but um i you know so i have these things with numbers and so i you know when i said it it's usually like at a five or a seven but it's low and you can just barely hear it so it won't keep you awake but i play the bible when i go to bed at night and i have really good night's sleep after i started doing this so it's a thought. I'm just, if you want to try it, see if it helps you. I'm, I'm willing to do just about anything. Mm -hmm. um, especially because e even though I don't necessarily uh, see myself a, a, as a Christian. Right. What, what I don't do is that I, I don't feel the need to, to denigrate the practice. And I think that faith is a fantastic thing. Yeah. So to be yeah. able to attach it to something, uh, to me, I, I find a lot of value in. So, yeah. no, that'd be something I'd be open to. Yeah, just keep, you know, keep your mind open because, you know, I mean, you know, like we talked about, we don't have the answers to everything. And the whole Christian faith could be on target. You know, it, it could be, you know, if you if you think about it like this could be real, 
you know, that right. God could be real and that you're in a journey in life to, to discover God. Like eventually you might come to a point where you do find him and you do discover that he's real. He might, you could ask him to reveal himself to you. And um, what really gets a lot of people are listening to those near death experiences where people encounter the Lord and people that are atheists, that are agnostic, that are doctors, that are, you know, ISIS members that have encountered the Lord and, you know, he's revealed himself to them and it's just completely changed their life. People that have died and, you know, gone to heaven and seen him that didn't even know him and he's there, you know? So with that in mind, just, you know, try playing the Bible when you sleep at night and see if it does help you at all. You might be shocked. So I would try it, Ash, honestly, just give it a whirl, you know? I'm definitely, definitely open to it. And I have been doing a lot of, of research lately in, into NDEs because mm-hmm. I, I am fascinated with the subject of, yeah. and I'm also fascinated with the subject of um, these corroborative experiences, people yeah. seeing things when they're out of body at the point of death that they are then able to verify with family members. Yeah. Yeah. They and they are numerous. Information. Yeah. Yeah. People that have the same dreams where they see the Lord. There were 200 ISIS members that actually had the same dream of seeing Jesus. And they went to a pastor after they were done who, you know, explained what the dream was about. And they all converted to being Christians when they were, by the time it was all said and done. So that's very interesting. It, I, I had it, actually not heard about that. Yeah, it, that was a good story. There was a pastor that um, he went to, he was sent over by the Lord. He'd gotten messages from the Lord because you can hear him talk. And he was sent over to, um, you know, do some, uh, be an, an, you know, a, um, a evangelist, do evangelistic work. And he, this guy was murdered by these ISIS, by these ISIS guys, by the, their whole crew. He was taken out of his home and he was murdered. <laughs> then this other man came along and he had gotten a message from God that he was supposed to go to the same place. And he was like, what are you, how are you out of your mind, you know, to the Lord. And he was talking to God in prayer and saying, you know, there's just no way you want me to go here. I'm going to be, di- I'm going to die. And the Lord was very adamant with him about it. He had shown him signs and given him dreams and messages that this is where he wanted him to go. So he went, he, he took his family which I can't believe he took his family. That's just insanity to me. Yeah. But he took his family, moved them over there, but they had faith in God that this is where they were supposed to be. And these ISIS guys showed up at his door one night. They He answered the door and he saw them and they put a, a black bag over his head and they kidnapped him. And he got, you know, then they took him to wherever they had to take him and took the, the bag off and they said, he, you know, he thought he was going to, he was going to die. And they said, no, we're not here to kill you. We need to under, we need to understand this dream, this interpretation. Every single one of us, there's 200 of us that had the same dream about Jesus. And I don't know the details. He, they didn't really get into all the details about the dream, but the, and then the, the man, you know, had, had heard the, the dream and interpreted for, interpreted it for them that this was a dream that you know explained that you know christianity and this is where you know you're supposed to be in this and that and so they all converted that night and they didn't they didn't kill him they they sent him back to his home and they all became christians so they saved it, this this whole dream 200 people in one night dreamed about jesus and they were isis you know they were isis militants and they were murderers and they repented so it was a pretty cool, is a cool story, but there's, there's so many of these, there's, there's just hundreds of them. And when, you know, when you ever doubt the fact that God could be there, it's something that, you know, I don't believe we know everything about God. I don't believe the Bible is, tells the full story. <laughs> you know, right, I think there's right. a lot about our God that we don't know and has been robbed of us, but I do believe he's there. You know, I've had some really crazy encounters with lo- the Lord I'll have to tell you they're in my other episodes, but I've had some just miracle healings and everything from him, you know, so pretty crazy stuff. When you ask him something, he typically finds a way to answer you. So well, and I, I, and I think that goes back to what we were talking about before was that a, a lot of it is asking questions. I, I, I think that we need to ask questions more mm-hmm. and, and, and not just because, you know, it, it leads us to educate ourselves more or leads us to become hobbyists at things that we never thought we'd be interested in. But just the fact that I think there's a very humbling exercise 
in saying, I don't have answers, but I'd really like them. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's, it's just, it's just neat. I, I don't know. I just, I'm very close to God now. I, I was on a journey for years that for 10 years I was angry as can be at him. I mean, I was just furious and, you know, I was, I completely thought I was an agnostic at that point and just, you know, and if there was any God, I just, you know, was just hated him for about a decade. And I just, I asked him to come to me one day and he boom was there the next day. The next day I got this, this testimony that showed up out of nowhere and it was a near death experience type thing. And it just completely, I knew he had answered me and he's just kind of grabbed me up and just has taken me on this whole journey, you know, with the government, with, you know, things that have been uncovered, you know, just with everything. And, and that's how I ended up here. I, I ended up podcasting because of all of it. And I just, I never thought I'd be doing this, but I, I did. So it was, it's been amazing, but he'll take you on quite a journey and he'll reveal a lot of things and he'll connect you to people. That's what really amazes me about him is how he connects all of us. You know, th these connections right. that just get made out of nowhere. You know, it just, it, it doesn't, it just boggles your mind sometimes. So well, I'm always up for a new adventure. Yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> me too. Well, good. Maybe I'll take you to, to see Robin when she wants me to come down there to see the dog men and the Bigfoot. <laughs> well, that, uh, I mean, you know, Rogman, Bigfoot. We just had a recent Bigfoot sighting within minutes from me. Did you really? Yeah. Um, around, if you take a look around uh, Pawnee, Illinois, which is a small town I used to live in a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. there have been um, a number of sightings in that area in Illinois. And again, just one recently about, um, I think it was about three or four days ago. Wow. That's in fact, amazing. The guy who made the sighting, I think we're going to have on on my show that's really cool that's really cool yeah I'll have to, i mean that's just amazing <laughs> amazing illinois you always think of illinois as chicago like the really big city you know you don't realize there's like all this farmland and stuff around it too you know i think what, that's what people don't realize is that that's really just a hinge <laughs> at the top yeah. of the state yeah like everything else is south of chicago right yeah, I love Chicago. I have a I have a good friend of mine, John, that lives in uh, Chicago. He's in the film making business as well. He was actually working with um, Andrew, who I don't want to give out last names and everything, but he he actually yeah. worked on the Twilight movie. Oh, and, nice. Yeah, and he's a friend of mine too. I've I've talked to him many times on the phone. I've lost touch over the years. I've got a some of this podcasting is kind of making me, you know, want to, you know, reach out to some of my my um, old friends that were in the movie industry and stuff that I've kind of lost touch with, but you know, it, it, they're just really cool people. They're really neat to talk to. I, I, really I think those them. kinds of adventures that we put ourselves on talking about adventures and journeys at one point in the film, um, there's an, an actor that comes in who plays um, the lead character's brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. Now, what was very interesting about this was that it's actually played by my college roommate who I had not seen in about 26 years. Yeah. Um, his wife had talked to a friend of mine and he'd went to film school. I knew he was always interested in film and um, had been an editor for years. And I got his number again through them and through their conversation and called him up and I said, hey, you know, how we, we, we've been trying to get together. And I said, you know, God, we haven't seen each other in, you know, 20 yeah. plus years. Right. I said, I'm shooting this film. And he's like, well, when are you shooting it? I said, you know, we're doing um, a, one of these bigger scenes over the weekend, which is when most of the cast is available. And he said, I'll drive over. It was about two wow. and a half, three hours away. He's like, I'll drive over. So hadn't seen him in 26 years. Popped on set. It was like we had talk to each other yesterday yeah never lost a beat never that's lost amazing a beat. Yeah, th yeah that's what i mean it's like my best friend and i are like that wendy she we went to school together we're best friends all our lives and we lost contact for like 20 years and we still like you know we were we typically will talk every day but lately we haven't been i've been just so busy with all this stuff but um you know it's it's amazing but this this stuff with the podcasting and like some of the stuff 
the people that I'm being connected to, honest to God, Ash, it feels like there's something going on here. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. when you, when you keep meeting filmmakers and you keep, I, I continuously am connected to people that are in the movie industry and filmmakers and stuff. And I'm trying to, you know, I'm writing scripts. I went to acting school. I've, I've had many times, so many people that have tried to get me involved with doing movies with them and stuff. And I just have never, just never had the, the chance to because of family and such, you know, but I just, it, there just feels like there's something that really connects people. There's reasons why it's going on. There's something outer worldly that's going on here with some of this stuff. Uh, I, I think it is. I think we're, we're part of a network that we're unaware of. Yeah, there has to be. Yeah. I have too many connections. Like some of the, like one of my really close friends is, was one of the heads of Universal Studios, you know, it, it just, it's just really odd to me. You know, why is it that I'm constantly being connected to people like this? I just don't, I don't understand it, but there's got to be something. I really feel that something is really pushing me in a direction that I'm not quite aware of yet. And it's really doing it, especially now, like something's really guiding me and pushing me into a different direction now. No, so, I, feel the same. I, I feel this um ramping up sort of quality for whatever it's worth. Yeah. But it, it feels like there's more of a sense of urgency now than there has been in the past. Right. Yeah. And, and there's people that are being brought into my life that really neat people that I really have, you know, just growing closer and closer to. And I just, and it just keeps going. Like every time I turn around, there's somebody new or, you know, somebody that, and then I, we end up becoming really close friends. And it, it's just, it's really, it's amazing. This, this experience and this journey that, you know, I've been on and, and this, it's just really getting cool. You know, I got to say it's, it's really becoming a really cool life, you know? Well, so I hope you're still going to talk to me after you see the movie. Oh, you're darn right. I am. I got plans <laughs> for you, Buster. <laughs> I don't know if you caught my episode yesterday. I did what I had another filmmaker that came on and I'm um, Patrick Cutler. He's working on a movie right now. And I, you know, this is, you know, I'm just like, what is going on? Like, why is this happening? But, um, he, um, you know, we were talking about the movie, the script I'm writing, mm -hmm. and I was going to talk to you about that as well. I wanted to see what you thought about this. Because it would be really cool. And I wanted to talk to you about like illustrations and stuff. But yes, I definitely, Certainly. I'd like to have you on again too. You know, if you'd like to come back on, I'm sure there's things that we didn't cover today. There's, so. there's I could go over the last two and a half years of experiences that I've been having in what I think is a dream state. Yeah. That we could probably talk an entire episode about. Yeah. I would really like to have you on again for that because I know there's some supernatural things you've personally had and I'd like to cover and we just don't have the time to do it today, but you know, maybe like, you know, in a week or two, we can do this. I'm always available. Always. Yeah. Available. That would be, except for your birthday. <laughs> right. And even then I'm making myself available. <laughs> Are you getting any glares from your wife yet? No, she's she's coming a couple of times. I, I think with the look like, why aren't you helping me clean that? You're like, honey, I'm busy right now. <laughs> yeah, I think she established a psychic link with me for just a few seconds, and that message came through. I, I was waiting to to just kind of feel that you know that look that you'd get from her. I know I'm supposed to be at work. I'm supposed to be at work. We're both we're supposed, we both have plans today. We're like, ah, oh, heck, let's just do a two hour yeah. podcast. That's nothing. It's like a Superman <laughs> heat vision kind of thing. <laughs> Like, just draw to each other we can't we can't control ourselves like, I'm who needs for money an item or two to combust around me somewhere yeah. yeah who needs money and who needs a birthday party i mean we just had to podcast yeah. today <laughs> yeah. oh god that's crazy well i will let you i will let you get to your you know hopefully helping your wife with the party preparations Most and um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll message you in a couple of days. Give me, you know, probably, you know, probably like Tuesday or something. I'll, yeah. I'll shoot you a message and, you know, I want to talk to you a lot about some things. So. And in the meantime, yeah. if you could, um, in a text, give me your email and I'll send you the, uh, screen okay. for the film. Oh, that would be great. Yes. Do that as soon as you can. I want to watch that, you know, hopefully tonight or tomorrow, if you, whenever you get a chance to send it to me. It's so. good and dark, good and late. Okay. Okay. That'd be awesome. Or or 2 p.m. 
which is now yeah. what they're calling the devil's hour. <laughs> I'll watch the movie at three in the morning. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Oh, okay, everybody, pull up your popcorn. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Well, Ash, it was awesome having you on, hon. This is so great. I'm really... I feel the same way. Thank you so much yeah. for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think that we're going to have a, a really cool friendship in the, you know... Me too. In the future here, so... You Definitely. take care of yourself. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Yeah. And um, I will be talking to you soon. Sounds good. Take care. All right. Take care, hon. Bye-bye. Bye. What a great interview. I just had so much fun talking to Ash. I can't wait to have him back on. And I am now going to go and make a nice hot cup of tea and sit down and watch Ash's movie. Holes in the Sky, the Sean Miller story. So when it comes out, guys, make sure you catch this. It is, it like I said, what I saw just to kind of do a preview of it looked, it just looked amazing. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. I can't wait to see the rest of it tonight. So you guys enjoy your evening. Love to you all. God bless you. Stay safe. Say your prayers. And I will be talking to you soon. Take care, everybody.